Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so hello. much for joining today. We are excited to have you here on this week's session of Intentional Conversations. We're going to allow space and time for those who are joining to get in and get settled. But per usual, please take to the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from. We always love to see how wide our broadcast community is. I'm joining from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So here in the Southwest, we have uh, Valerie joining us from Los Angeles today and John out in South Carolina. All righty. Well, we have a super exciting show um, set up for today. I'm super excited about the conversation that we're having. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone again to Intentional Conversations. So Intentional Conversations, um, this is our third year anniversary of IC. We are so, so excited about that. So much great content. So many amazing hosts have joined us over this period of time. Um, and we're super, super excited to be sharing that milestone. And we want to share that with you all as well. So we are asking the question, which guest would you like most for us to bring back? We have had some amazing conversations. And so many times we walk away from those conversations saying, we needed more time, we have to have a part two, or maybe even a part three. Um, so if there's someone that you're wanting us to bring back onto the show, please, please let us know. We would love to work on making that happen. Um, I will have our, um, I'll have one of my colleagues po post Amora's email into the chat. Please just email Amora with that guest name and we will do our best to make that a reality. Um, as we continue to celebrate three years of IC. <clears throat> um, so April is Autism Awareness Month. Um, and it is definitely a time to recognize and promote understanding of autism spectrum, spectrum disorder or ASD. Um, and you know, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, ASD affects an estimated one in 54 children in the United States. Um, so by raising awareness and understanding, we can promote early diagnosis support individuals with ASD, and create a more inclusive society. Um, we're also still celebrating Black Women's History Month, um, definitely a time to celebrate the accomplishments of Black women and honor their contributions to society. Um, but it's also a reminder of the importance of inclusion, diversity, and equity in the space that we all occupy, um, and a time to recognize the unique experiences and challenges faced by Black women. So we just continue to ask, and not just this month, but 365 days throughout the year, um, to take the opportunity to celebrate the strength, resilience, and perseverance of Black women, especially in the face of adversity. Um, this is a reminder that uh, Dr. Nika White's latest book, published by Forbes Book, Inclusion Uncomplicated, A Transformative Guide to Simplify DEI, is out. It's available. Um, please go out and grab that if you have not. It's available in bookstores on Amazon, and it's also available in audiobook and on Kindle. Um, and if you have already copped your copy, please take the time and leave a review. It really helps those authors um, to just push them out there and, and, and make others aware of the experience that you had while you were reading that. Take to social media, share it out, maybe gift one to a friend if you found it useful. We really appreciate your continued support. All right, so you know we like to set everyone up for what's coming up. Um, and next week, we are super excited to have Sharon Hurley Hall joining us to discuss topics from her books, I'm Tired of Racism and Exploring, and Exploring Shadism. So be sure to be with us um, next Friday on the 28th 
Nika will be back and uh, we'll be we'll be hosting alongside Sharon on this really exciting conversation. Um, and then we have a great month lined up for May. Um, so we have um, all of our guests um, that will be joining us, great conversations that will be taking place at that time. So please mark your calendars to be a part of this or to catch the replay on um, our podcast. You know that we are available on all streaming platforms um, so that you can catch that and listen to it while maybe you're driving to work or from work, um, working out whenever you have that time. But yes, super excited about the guests that we have joining us in May. And now, without further ado, I am super excited to introduce our guest for today's conversation, Ms. Valerie Williams. Um, of course, I'm going to start by reading her bio. Um, and if we could go ahead and um, spotlight Valerie, I will do that now. So Valerie Williams is the founder, founder and managing partner at Converge is a diversity champion and community builder with over 16 years of experience advocating for fairness and equity in the workplace. Prior to launching Converge, Valerie served as global head of inclusion and diversity at Stripe and helped create the foundational diversity and belonging program at Airbnb. Valerie has extensive executive business and technical recruiting experience at Google, Airbnb, and Russell Reynolds, as well as four years of supply chain and operations experience at Hewlett Packard. She studied industrial and systems engineering at Georgia Tech and holds an MBA from Emory University. Valerie has served as a guest lecturer at Emory, <clears throat> USC, and UC Berkeley, and is sought after as a thought leader on workforce inclusion and the future of the workplace. So podcast community, let's take to the chat, let's use those reactions and let's all welcome Valerie as she joins us today. We're so excited to have her here. Um, oops, excuse me. Thank and, you so much, Courtney. Yes, yes, and sorry about that everyone, <laughs> but yes, we are so excited to have you here. And um, Valerie, we like to do this here at IC because we read the bio. Um, and of course, that kind of grounds us on how we have, why we have asked you to come and bring your expertise to this conversation. But we also like to take the opportunity to allow you to share something that maybe we would not know from your bio, from your website, from your, pay, um, from your social media. Um, that kind of helps us uh, connect with you at a different level. So if you would love to share something, no pressure, but um, just any kind of random fun fact to kind of center us today. I love I love that. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I love having conversations with fellow practitioners. So really appreciate the opportunity. And I also appreciate that question because I feel like I was talking to like three or four friends yesterday and we all were talking about how so identified we are with work and with business, our businesses, our careers. And so I appreciate that question because yeah. you just read a bio all about my career. <laughs> People don't know who I am. So Maybe I'll share one fun fact. Um, I'm a big like yoga, uh, avid yoga person. So right after this, I'm going to go to my hot yoga class. I try to get it in four or five times a week, just kind of keep me balanced, keep me zen. So that's maybe a fun fact people don't know about me. Well, that's awesome. I tried hot yoga and um, <clears throat> Yeah, it was an experience. Um, I definitely was like, maybe I should have done like regular yoga first. You know, I kind of just hopped right out there. But that's aggressive. Um, that's aggressive. Yeah, it, it was pretty, you know, I was pretty sure of myself at that time. And, um, but I love that I, um, I have become recently obsessed with um, Pilates, but, um, and bar. Um. And um, I really enjoy those. And so, um, yeah, maybe I'll give it a try now that I've had some experience with some of those. Try to circle back, you know, yeah. try it one more time. <laughs> yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And yeah. I am one, I love to big up and to just, um, you know, stand, especially um, other people in the space who are doing amazing things. And reading your bio, I'm just like, man, like, wow. You know, like you have, you know, done so much in your 16 years or in and maybe even more than that, but like, you know, from supply chain, from, you know, working with Airbnb, working with Stripe and doing these huge initiatives with those companies. And then even being um, your BA being in engineering and having an MBA. I mean, all of this that has really just kind of 
created the person you are professionally today. So can you kind of just walk us through kind of how this all, you know, transpired, kind of how, you know, you have all the way leading up to Converge, but, um, you know, what kind of has been that journey for you? Because it's really amazing. And I would love to kind of just see, because I love when um, it looks like things are just working out in your favor and it's all yes. like something and yes. um, connecting those dots to where you are today. I love that. You know, that's how you know that you're doing the right thing, right? When you have some momentum behind you and things just start lining up. Mm -hmm. um, when I think about my career and I think about where kind of advocacy came from in my career, I go back honestly to middle school. So I like to tell this story around um, in middle school, I was part of the NAACP Youth Council. I went to school with several people that their parents were prominent in NAACP and we we were little, you know, change agents in middle school trying to, you know, fight for justice for us to be able to wear what we wanted to wear, you know, in um, middle school as an example. So, you know, when I think about that advocacy journey, it really started there. Um, but um, when I got to college, I was really peer pressured. I went to Georgia Tech um, and um, I chose that um, to get the state scholarship in Georgia. People are familiar with the whole scholarship. And I thought I was going to go directly into business. But when I got there, I started to learn more about engineering and learn more about the different disciplines within engineering and uh, landed on industrial and systems engineering as the kind of most non-technical engineering, you know, functions or disciplines um, where we, we were focused a lot on math and processes. And so that felt that felt good to me. Um, and so, but after school, I ended up going and starting a career in supply chain and operations um, and uh, did that for a few years until that didn't really quite feel right. I feel like I was missing that advocacy piece, right? I was mm -hmm. missing that. How can I help people? How can I really um, advocate for people? Um, and so I went to business school and, and came out and switched my career into this human capital and eventually DEI. Um, uh, role that I'm in right now. So that's a little bit of the high level journey of how it kind of all fits together, the, all of those kind of disparate pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to go into any more uh, deeper into any of those um, as we continue our conversation. Yes, yes. No, I love that. And and typically that is kind of the journey, right? Like you try something and it's like, uh, yeah, there's some yeah, it. <laughs> but it doesn't feel like that's just quite it. So then you kind yeah. of pivot. And, That's but right. it's amazing too, how all of those create building blocks for mm -hmm. the work that you're doing, because it's like, man, you have all these experiences and they can tie in and they can make you even better for the work that you are destined to do, which is, Absolutely. you know, what you're doing today. So um, I always kind of love to hear that story because everyone's journey is different um, yes. and it all matters. <laughs> it definitely yeah, and, matters. and with that, Corey, I'm so glad you, Courtney, I'm glad you said that because you know, what, what I try to do and what we try to do at Converge is really take a systems approach to DEI, right? And that no doubt came from my kind of studying around industrial and systems engineering and processes. We really try to look at the whole system to try to attack different things that might be happening in the workplace. So it all fits together, even if you don't know how it's all going to fit together right. yet, it will serve you in the future. Absolutely. It's that strategy, that strategic thinking, you know, I feel like all of that is built into the experience that you have, because it's like, yes, I know how to look at this and take this approach and, and advise you in a way that may not feel like the next step, because you're not seeing it from the, from the full, you know, lens that we are able to see that. And, and kind of with that, I know that you helped create the foundational diversity and belonging program at Airbnb. And so like, what advice would you give DEI practitioners who are creating a program from scratch, who are working within, you know, these larger organizations and trying to make, you know, some impactful change, <laughs> kind of what was that experience like and what advice would you give for them? Yeah, so first let me talk about what that experience was like. So um, I know we have a lot of people here um, that may remember the hashtag Airbnb while Black days yes. where there was a lot of talk around discrimination on the platform, right? And so mm -hmm. I was at Airbnb at the time, I was on the recruiting team um, and uh, you know, this kind of discrimination issue arose in the company and we were already forming the diversity and belonging team, but when this kind of hit the fan, um, it really expedited our need to 
dig deeper into that function. Mm -hmm. um, so it was such a it was such a formative time in my career. Definitely one of my uh, favorite working experiences at Airbnb, developing that program for scratch, and the beauty of the way that we developed it because there was so much heat on the product it was a huge cross-functional effort with all of our c-suite members involved and we really did take a systems approach it was quite cross-functional we looked at product we looked at design we looked at recruiting we looked at development um right within the organization mm -hmm. so um quite formative so what i would tell people as they are building DEI strategies, DEI programs from scratch. One, you have to have some sort of framework or process or articulation of how you're getting to build that program, right? And that's why we developed that strategy creation process that we have at Converge to help people say, okay, DEI can mean so many things. Everyone has an opinion about what you should be doing. How do we create a framework and a program that honors everyone's opinions, honors everyone's experiences, but is impactful and uh, actually designed in a way that is sustainable? Um, and so what I would encourage people, if you're building a new program, you first have to start with your why. We always start with your why. Why? Why DEI? Why now? Why is this important to your business? Right? Like really get crystal clear on that. Because without the why, you're, you're kind of going to be just throwing things at the wall. You may be kind of going into different directions and not understanding why you're not having the right impact that you're having. So I would say, one, when you're building a new program, start with your why. Get crystal clear on your why. It'll help you as things, you know, like right now in the economy um, are going, you know, declining in the economy. It'll help you sustain your momentum as well. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing I'll say is make sure you have all key stakeholders voices in developing that program. So you want to hear from your leadership team. You want to obviously hear from your employees as well so that they feel like it's authentic to them and that you're actually meeting their needs. So just a couple of things. We work with teams all the time when they're developing programs and strategies from scratch. So it's it's kind of what we actually do quite best. Yes. And I love that. I love that, Valerie, starting with your why, you know, and it's that is so important. It's embedded into a lot of different processes. I was listening to a podcast the other day and this was a market, you know, he, uh, the gentleman who used to be head of marketing for Nike. And he was saying that's his first question when he's helping people create marketing strategies is what is your why, you know, so mm -hmm. I think really approaching it the same that you would any other major process in your organization is super important and really getting crystal clarity and grounding um, on what that is so that it, like you said, serves as a pathway forward because things are going to happen and, you know, stuff is not going to go sure. as planned. Mm -mm. Um, <laughs> and, and really being, you know, centered on that will kind of help you stay the course. Um, so I really Absolutely. love that. And, and actually you kind of brought up, you know, all of this kind of economic uncertainty right now. And there's a lot of stuff happening. You're seeing mass reductions in workforce, layoffs, spending freezes, Tons of things are taking place and these are happening at these large global companies. You know, it's not just, you know, kind of, I feel like COVID, it felt really like focused on like the small businesses, but now you're seeing it where everyone's really being impacted. And so um, with that taking place, you know, how can companies empower DEI teams amid all of this uncertainty? Yeah. You know, it's it's so interesting. So coming because I spent so much of my uh, career in tech, many of our clients that Converge come from tech, they're venture backed mm -hmm. tech companies. And so this quarter, the first quarter of the year really hit the industry hard, as many of you know. Mm -hmm. And we we work with, you know, 12 to 15 clients at a time. And just with the clients that we worked with, we had four people get fired, four DEI people get fired or let go or their teams laid off. And it was just so it's just so heartful considering all of the momentum that we all have been putting in, especially though since 2020. Um, but for our clients that have teams that are remaining and have individuals that are still doing DEI, some things that we've seen have been working to help kind of keep that momentum going and to support those DEI members. So one, you may have laid off some folks, but you may have people that are still in the organization that can provide some administrative support, some project management support. So if maybe you had to downsize your DEI team, um, maybe you can repurpose some talent to help 
um, those team members with some of that administrative work that undoubtedly goes with um, DEI efforts. So that's one way, you know, really repurposing internal resources. I think second, DEI practitioners especially feel isolated within their organizations, right? Like no one really knows their job. If you don't have like a counterperson that does DEI with you, you may feel isolated. So how can we help those practitioners get community outside and, and connection outside of the workplace, you know, through collaborations, through conferences, through professional development opportunities, so they can still get nourished and fed and supported and get direct um, help with their, um, their efforts to keep mm -hmm. those efforts going. So those are a couple of things that we've seen. Some companies do really repurpose some internal resources to help with um, executing those strategies that a lot of them put together a couple of years ago. Um, and then also looking for ways to directly support those DEI practitioners with external resources, knowing that they just don't necessarily have the capacity or the ability to do that for DEI folks. Right. Absolutely. I love those. I love those. And, and a question we get often from um, clients, especially if they don't have maybe a dedicated team who is doing the work, they have champions who are doing it in addition to their day, mm -hmm. day, day job. It's kind of like, okay, how can we equip them? And I think those are some great, great tools. It's like, you know, repurposing, not everyone has to maybe, you know, have a lot of DEI expertise to, to support the efforts. Like you said, it could be administrative support. It could be, you know, just a, a myriad of things. And so I love that. And I think that is very, very good information for, for those who are listening. Um, and, and kind of to that point, you talked about, you know, providing resources, you know, for those practitioners. Um, and we talk a lot about like wellness and mindfulness, especially for um, those who are practicing in this work, because we know that it's heavy and we know that it can be hard. And so um, what does workplace wellness kind of mean? And, and what does that look like um, when practiced healthily? And, and how does that kind of really benefit those who are centered around this work of the EI? Yes. Yes. Well, first, first, I think we all, and I, I feel like we're all doing a better job of this, but um, since 2020, since the pandemic, but I think we all first have to take our individual, like, accounting of how we're doing on our mental health, our, our mental health, our mental wellness, our overall wellness, right? And so um, I'm currently, you know, April for us is is really a slower month. And so I'm, I'm on a light sabbatical. This is like one of the only things I'm doing this month to just reset and take time to revisit your why, to take time to revisit how you want to show up in this work and to just really pour into yourself and to rest. And so for me, workplace wellness, what that means at the workplace level is that an organization allows individuals to do that. It creates the infrastructure for individuals to be able to do that, to take the time that they need. Um, it also provides, um, in, an organization that does this well, provides a variety of, of options for people to do that, right? Some people may wanna take weeks off. Some people may just want to uh, recharge in a different way. And so organizations that are successful in this tend to offer many options for people to be able to like, just take a step back from work when you need to. And so that's what I think workplace wellness is, is the ability for us to put work back in its proper place in our lives. And for uh, the organization to have the infrastructure to the, allow the individuals to do so. Do so. I love that. To put work back in the, like where it's supposed to be, it's, that, that's been my term this year, okay? <laughs> I encourage everyone who's listening, you got to put it back in this proper place in your life, right? Yeah. Because especially for us in business, we're so identified with this work and it's, it's, it's great work that we do, but we're full people, we're full humans, we're mothers, we're, you know, parents, we're, you know, caregivers. And so, you know, returning back to the wholeness of yourself, I think is important. And again, organizations that understand that um, are allowing for more flexibility for people to be able to do that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think it's also about um, organizations really being okay with trusting their employees, especially yes. post-COVID. I feel like COVID was like this amazing, like free test on how will people do if if they are not being micromanaged? How will people do yes. alone? <laughs> and the data is saying, 
amazing. They'll do amazing. Totally fine. Totally you're gonna be, fine. You're going to make more money. <laughs> you're going to do so great. Like yeah. it, it works. And yet we're seeing this huge, like return back to work and co co like companies still like deciding that it's in the best interest of their, of their employees to be <clears throat> at work and, and to not have even the flexibility of a hybrid environment, you yeah. know, some, and I do know, I talked to many folks and they are like, Hey, I need both. I need some interaction with my colleagues. Sure. And then, you know, and I also want that flexibility. So I get that maybe remote completely is not, you know, everyone's choice, but most are looking for that flexibility that you talk That's about. It. And so like, how can organizations um, really kind of focus more on creating that accessibility for, for, you know, people who are wanting maybe a more hybrid work environment or who are looking for, um, that flex, like the flexibility that we talked about, and then what are some DEI, like, or how are DEI strategies then affected by this new change in moving into yeah. more of a hybrid work environment or work a remote first, you know, culture, you know, how is this kind of DEI affected and how we are leaning in in that way? <clears throat> yeah, well, I think you know, it's interesting. So I think it's a two part to that question. So the first part with how I think DEI strategies are being affected, well, one, on the D, right? So now that we're hybrid, now that most um, workplaces are hybrid or at least have the ability for people to access them in some way in a hybrid way, you obviously can access talent from around the world now. Like mm -hmm. you can open up the opportunities for talent to around the world. So this concept of diversity becomes a lot easier for you to try to tackle if your talent pool now opens up from your local city to this wider global audience, right? So we obviously have been seeing, um, you know, some successes in, in being able to reach that talent. Now you may not be able to understand how to access or reach that talent, but now the talent pool is wide open, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one big, huge change I've been seeing, particularly for some of our clients that, are, that have been in, you know, sort of like monogam um, really uh, non-diverse environments, right? Um, and then two, what's been happening, what's been interesting is that we're, we're seeing a lot of compensation structures change. And so this concept of pay equity has been interesting and brought back to the front. So now if your workplace is all over and you've been building your compensation structures and bands based on location, then that mm -hmm. all kind of starts crumbling. And what does pay equity now uh, mean uh, for workplaces? And so those have been two of the big kind of hot button issues we've been working with our clients on of how do we redevelop our policies and rethink what equity looks like in this new hybrid environment. Now, your other question around like, you know, um, how do we how do we uh, just wrestle with this kind of new hybrid environment and what does it mean for like DEI long term? Um, you know, I think if we keep going down this 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 um, this path of flexibility, and we keep going down this path of offering options to employees that kind of free them up a little bit, I think that's the direction we need to go. Um, I have a lot of friends that have been working with their companies for a long time, where their companies are like, "Okay, great, we trust you. You work with us a long time. You want to start working part time now? Okay, cool. Let's try to figure out how to make that work." for both of us, for the company and for you, because we see that you have been with us, you have a track record and we wanna really work with you. And so starting to look again at these sort of flexible uh, arrangements, even for people that might be senior within your organization, I've been seeing that a lot for companies that wanna retain that talent, right? If you have mm -hmm. director level talent and they're like, hey, I really kinda wanna go to four days a week or three days a week, how can we figure that out? I have a new family. We're seeing companies be more and more receptive to that uh, on a one-off basis, but I am really, really hoping that more companies start to put more infrastructure around that to allow that to be available to the masses. Absolutely, absolutely. And I am curious, kind of just to your point um, about, you, you know, you've been talking with, you know, some people and, and you, you're kind of looking at ways in which those individuals can maybe move towards a more hybrid or, you know, flexible schedule. Do you mm -hmm. think that there is, there's work or there are things that DEI um, practitioners can be doing to help organizations trust 
their employees a little bit more to be able to kind of empower them to feel okay with saying, yes, yes, we can accommodate these, these requests and these schedules. Is, is there a place really for, for, you know, DEI practitioners to kind of advise in that way or, or what, you know, kind of what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think as practitioners, what, what we should be trying to do well is to really capture current state sentiment well. Like how are employees feeling? What's the latest pulse on, you know, the engagement within the organization? And how can we make sure our marginalized folks especially don't feel isolated, right? And so as practitioners, we, we have to be able to capture um, that sentiment so that we see how these new environments are impacting communities. So I think that's one thing. And then I think, too, we, ha we have to be storytellers, right? We have to be able to say, okay, great, this, this new change or this new shift or this new policy, this is how this improves inclusion. This is how this improves overall sentiment around in the workplace. Um, and so I think that's the two levers where we play the most uh, roles in that conversation where we want to make sure, again, those that we're, we're capturing the sentiment, we understand what that experience is. And then two, that we're really, you know, thinking through how do we measure our impact and how do we tell the story around that impact so that that will encourage organizations to think through uh, developing those policies. I love that. I love that. Telling the story around the impact, because I think at the end of the day, as much as we understand and want people to lean into the human, the humanness of the, the importance of DEI, we do also understand that a lot of it is, is about showing and, and, and pr proving a little bit what it means and what that looks like for the organization um, when they do do these, you know, when these, when they make these changes and how powerful it can be. Um, and so, yes, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, if you're, if you're not tying back, not to cut you off, but if you're not tying back any of the work that you're doing to the business, there's a, there's a lot of, I guess, opinions around the business case for diversity. But in terms of motivating leadership teams to care, you know, what they're caring about are the business priorities. And so you have to figure out a way to articulate human needs in a business way. I believe. And so you yeah. got to kind of thread that needle, needle and figure out how to do both. Yeah. 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 And that actually, you know, thank you for saying that because it actually kind of sparked a question. I hope I can articulate this the way that it's formulating in my mind. Um, but I also know that, you know, a lot of times we focus on making that business case for leadership. But I think sometimes we also assume that everyone within the organization is also like it has the same sentiments, feels the same way, want the same things. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's not always the case. And we yeah. have seen, and I have, you know, you read different articles and, and different, you know, information on LinkedIn where um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, sometimes just differences in within the organization and that can cause the organization as a whole to pause because they're like, okay, I don't want to completely disrupt this group to appease this group. Um, so, and I think a good example of that is I was reading one where um, around parental leave, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, conversation, I feel like around that, because there are some who really understand the importance of that and having that um, available. Um, but then there are others who feel like, well, you know, you're almost being incentivized to have, to have kids, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, you get more vacation days. I think I saw that on LinkedIn, you know, that you get more vacation days. And it's like, you know, how do you kind of bridge those gaps when, when yeah. you're working with organizations to help them see the overall arching goal? Um, but you're also dealing with maybe not just leadership, but others within the organization and leadership trying to, to carefully walk that line um, to yeah. ensure that the employees are, are, are appeased and, you know, at bay as well. Kind of Am I, did I say that in a way that is a question that <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think I found a question in there though. No, um, I, you know, it's interesting because it's so aligned with what we're seeing directionally of the type of work that we're hearing that companies are needing. So since 2019, we've had like 70 clients. Let me just walk through my, our like type of work that we've been doing. Cause I think it's really interesting. So I started six months before the, before George Floyd's murder, right? And so I was just going to be an advisor for some startups, whoop de whoop. You know, I was going to take some time from the workplace. And then George Floyd's murder happened. And it just, I really had to scale converge quite quickly because we had quite a lot of business. And a lot of folks 
one at anti-racism workshops. No surprise there. In 2020, we delivered so many anti-racism workshops. That's all they wanted. We forced organizations, though, to think about org-wide strategy because we knew we, we didn't want to start stop at one-off workshops. We knew we wanted to like force people to think about this in a long-term way. So 2021 was all strategy. 2022 was all, okay, we have a strategy now. How do we implement this? How do we roll this out, right? And now, last year and this year, a big, huge thing that people are asking for is manager training. So to go back to your question around how do we like empower the whole organization to kind of get on board with all of these changes, keep up with all of these changes, everybody's trying to train managers because we know that there is their critical population to so much within the workplace. Mm -hmm. They're impacting people's day to days, whether they want to stay at the company or not, right? Like. How can you cast it down priorities from the leadership team in the proper way? Um, there are all these issues and new capabilities that managers need in this hybrid environment, right? In this kind of new environment that we're in. So to kind of direct, indirectly answer your question, we've been seeing a lot of manager enablement, manager training. How do we empower managers as this critical population in between leaders and employees to have have the tools to have these conversations with employees and to support them in the right way. Yes, yes, <clears throat> I love that. And um, I, I do see, I just wanna acknowledge that I do see Michaela's question in the chat. We will be opening okay. up the audience. I'm not gonna hog Valerie the entire time. <laughs> we'll be opening up the, um, for questions from the audience here in just a few minutes. I do have one more and then we'll pivot to um, the question that has been placed in the chat. Also, please know that you can place those questions in the chat, or once we get to that portion, you are more than welcome to use the reaction to raise hand, and we will spotlight you and bring you into this conversation. So you do have a couple of options there. Um, but just kind of on, you know, we've kind of talked about Converge, and we've kind of pivoted to the work that you've been doing since um, inception in 2019. Um, and so um, I'd love to kind of just spend a little time talking about your, you know, your firm and, mm -hmm. and learning a little bit more about um, the work that you all are doing there. I know that on the website, you have a three-step DEI strategy uh, creation process. And you kind of alluded to this earlier with that strategy creation being critical, but there's also a piece on insight and discovery, and then it goes into strategy creation and implementation and integration. And so um, I'd love to know a little bit more about how maybe this came about. And if yeah. you had to pinpoint the most critical step in that process, what would it be? Ooh, I love that. Um, well, first, um, we're stay tuned for our new branding. We have new branding. We're updating our website. Oh, so our I strategy. Love... Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So the strategy creation process that's on there, we actually have a four step process now. It's like a P zero in front of those three steps. But um, my time actually um, that I spent at Airbnb and Stripe helped inform uh, that creation of that framework. And I'll talk through the, the framework for people that may not know it. So P0, which is not on the site, which is the visioning piece that we've been talking about to start with the why. So step one is determining your why. And we tend to do that with leadership teams, right? So we start with leadership teams and we're like, okay, great. You want to do DEI. What does that mean to you? Like, let's get clear on definitions. How is this tied to your business? How do we keep this work top of mind for you and sustain it over time? So we start with leadership. And then um, step one after that, after P0 is insight and discovery, right? Like how do we know what we should be working on if we don't ask, if we don't uncover, if we don't dig deep into what's happening within the organization. And so that's when we talk to employees, we survey employees, we perform um, assessments around hiring and um, HR practices. And we just try to gather the information of the current state of the organization. And then after that, the next phase is um, strategy creation, where we get clear on our focus areas and our objectives. Um, I find that organizations are super murky on objectives. They're just like, I want to throw this program out. Let's do a DEI committee. Right. Well, what is the committee going to do? Talk to me about what, you, what are we accomplishing here, right? Oh, right. So we got to get real crystal clear, crystal clear on focus areas and objectives. And the resulting projects and KPIs, if you're an organization that looks heavily into KPIs and goal setting, we, we structure that into a framework so everyone's clear. So now we've 
honored the current state and captured the current state and we have a clear plan moving forward. And then the last piece, the implementation phase, which is phase three is, okay, we're rolling this out. Let's try this out, let's pilot. So we roll out programs as pilots, knowing that we roll this out, this is what we're trying to shift. So we're pre-testing it, we're post-testing it, did that work, let's figure it out, right? And so we just try to get very, again, prescriptive around that. For me, the most important piece um, of that process, honestly, is start with the why, which is why we are added it back in, right? Because we were kind of kind of doing that a little bit, but we're like, no, we need to get crystal clear on why this matters to organizations because without it, the plans are dying in implementation. You know, we've mm -hmm. created this wonderful plan and nothing's happening because we need to get your buy in. So um, I would say that's the most critical piece so that organizations can sustain this work. Yes, yes, I love that. And I really think that it's so important. And we, you know, similarly, you will, you will see where you've been working with an organization and then you kind of have this strategy and then it's like, all right, well, you know, it, it starts feeling like, okay, maybe some of the, the momentum yes. Is, is, is slowing and, yeah. and now there are other projects that need to be a priority. And so I think okay. you're so correct. If you center on that why early on and, and, and like, you know, embed that in the entire entirety of the process, it really just kind of really helps keep that top of mind. And I know a big thing for us here is ensuring that our clients understand that this is a, a continuous journey. It's yeah. not a destination, you know, you're not going to arrive it, uh, if we do our job right you will arrive to a place where you can do it effectively yourself but this is yes. work that you will be doing always it's not always you no know, always and it'll be changing you'll be pivoting you'll be um you know it, it's always changing so yes. I love that I love that and I know that we have a couple of questions mm -hmm. and so I'm going to pivot and then we'll come back to, 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 the, to, to my, to my questions. I'll be, I'm going to share, <laughs> I'm going to share this out. Um, okay. So, um, Michaela, do you want me to read? I'm happy to read it out loud, but if you would like to unmute and ask yourself, um, I would love to give you that opportunity. So hi there. Sure. I was trying okay. to figure out how to, how to um, raise my hand, but I couldn't do it. Um, okay. no so I ran a school for many years that, um, in New York city that, uh, one of our core aims, one of my core aims as the founder was always to have a very diverse student population. We did achieve that. Um, and uh, the trickier piece was um, ensuring that we had um, uh, mirrors, windows, and sliding doors in the classroom, right? So having the kind of content that would appeal to those kids and make sure they felt embraced in the classroom. Um, by the content and and even harder still was like there were tiers of difficulty then um, ensuring that faculty of color felt attracted to the school right because there was a vast majority of white faculty right and that reinforces itself and then um, ensuring that the parents of the children of color um, felt heard with their specific concerns that their children were expressing. Um, so I saw the cycle, right, mm. of function. But when I tried to, when I hired a DEI person who was relatively young in her practice, um, teachers um, pushed back. I would say the majority mm. of the teachers pushed back and felt like, Oh, we've heard this stuff already, you know, and mm -hmm. my mind went to the word differentiation. Like mm -hmm. we, we needed to find a way to just like we do with students to like establish baseline understandings and needs and probably break up into groups where people started their DEI work as teachers, but I didn't know how to do that. And we were small. So we mm -hmm. have like, limited budget. So just take mm. the big question, attack it any way you want. I'm sure it'll help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it sounds like there's a, a, a few things happening. So um, 
one, there's this um, this uh, concept of I'm trying to get to the core of your question, Michaela. Uh, I th I think if I were to think of the core, I would think that for organizations that are public facing, right? They have more stakeholders. They have a mm -hmm. wider variety of knowledge bases, understanding bases, and needs. Mm -hmm. How do you address all of that mm -hmm. difference with a program that's about addressing differences? Yeah. Okay. Right? I got you. I got you. Well, one, I think it's important to get clear on objectives. I talked about that in strategy creation because there's so many things you could be trying to solve for with each stakeholder group. So I think getting clear on we want to provide avenues and ways for each key stakeholder to participate and to uh, contribute to the program without overselling that their contribution will greatly influence the program, right? Because I think people always have a sense of like, I know what you should be doing as a DEI person. There's something about our function that everyone feels like they like know the best thing for us to be doing. Right. And so you have to toe that line between making sure people feel valued and heard, but not overselling how their contribution is going to influence or weigh in on the overall direction of the program. So I think that's one where perhaps if you're earlier in your career, I know I wasn't able to do that as a junior practitioner um, well until I got a few reps in. And so the other piece I'm hearing is that for your DEI practitioner that might be a little bit more junior in her career, maybe providing her with some support on how to, um, stakeholder management is such a key part of DEI. And so being able to navigate that is, is a critical a competency that she's gonna need in her career. And so maybe considering our mastermind or a coach or someone that can help her think through stakeholder management, because it is a little bit of an art, it's a little bit of a design um, in dealing with people and their perspectives. So thank you for sharing your, um, your about your workplace though um, and your question. Yes, thank you so much for that. And I do see your hand to Kia. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bring you into the conversation to ask Hi. your question. Nice to meet you, um, really great Hi. content. And I think um, my questions are really, that's probably the biggest part of DEI and it really piggybacks off of Michaela. We're just getting started here, our company working with NWC and we're gonna jump into creating a strategy. And you talked about really, you know, getting that cross-functional approach and digging into each uh, department and how DEI affects that department and how it incorporates it. Um, what do you do when, you know, you have different departments that are like, you know, we don't, what we do has nothing to do with DEI. And like, why does this matter to us? How do you help to get that buy-in? Because I think the biggest part is like, once we get started, we want this to be sustainable. We want to keep the momentum going. We want everyone to have buy-in. Um, but then you have a department, maybe like IT, that will say, you know, what, what do we have to do with this? Yeah, why does it matter to me? Why are we talking about this, right? And that's why we really do start with that, start with the why uh, exercise with the leadership teams to tie it to business priorities so that each functional leader can understand how it fits into their, um, their function, right? So our start with the why process, and I'm sure NKC has something similar um, or comparable, um, but we pre-survey those leaders so that we understand kind of where they are, where their readiness is, what their business priorities are, so that when we come into that experience, we're speaking their language and we are talking directly to them. And then we're not just kind of talking about this kind of abstractly, we're talking about it as it relates to the business. So that might be one thing to pre-engage those functional leaders in a way so that their voices are being heard in a, in a way in a pre-survey situation. Um, it's, it's hard though, you know, we, it's, it's something that all DEI programs struggle with and have to figure out how to keep those key stakeholders involved. Um, I'll say the other thing too, is that we find that employee stories tend to kind of help people 
that might be resistant um, get involved. So there's normally, there's that business case, there's the societal case, and then that emotional case for us is elevating employee story. So like IT person, you don't care that this person feels isolated in your team. Okay, maybe you do care now. And let's talk about why this person may feel marginalized or isolated in your team. And now that sparks you to care a little bit more. So those are just two things I think that probably can help. And I'm sure NKC will um, be great, a great partner for you in that, in that endeavor. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Takia, for joining the conversation and um, for your question. And Valerie, the questions have been rolling in, but I want <laughs> to pause and ask um, you one question um, that I think is very important. You referenced it in a response, I think, earlier, but mm -hmm. tell us more about some of the upcoming projects that you're working on, especially the Converge Mastermind. Um, I'd love to yeah. hear more about that. Yes, absolutely. I mentioned the Mastermind earlier. So at Converge, we um, kind of think of us in three prongs. So DEI consulting, we've been talking a lot about. We also uh, do foundational training uh, for our organizations where we uncover a lot of concepts. I'm sure you all know bias, allyship, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that we've launched, we just launched this year, excited about is our mastermind. And uh, it's a way for us to empower um, the practitioners. And it started last year, I brought together a small group of our clients that were practitioners in their, their, uh, their organizations. And it was a group of six or seven of us. And we just met on a monthly basis to collectively brainstorm, to um, support each other, share resources. And so we launched the mastermind community this year to facilitate more of that. So um, for folks that might be interested, convergemastermind.com is where you can find out more information, where there's some coaching elements to it. There's best practices elements, but it's more about community and connection. Uh, we know this work is hard and it's really important for us all to have spaces for us, not to just support each other and, and care and love on each other because we need that, but, but also to like collectively brainstorm and strategize particularly for people that are like one teams of one in their organization, right? So yes. um, check, it, check it out. That's what our mastermind is all about. That is amazing. And I love that because um, so much of a lot of questions we get on, I see a lot of conversations. Like I said, we talk a lot about wellness and mindfulness and especially for the practitioners. And I love that you're creating this space because mm. two or one, it's very, um, we've talked about this work is taxing. It can be heavy. Um, so yes. having a space with community to kind of lean into that with others who understand is so important. Yes. Um, but then two, to have a, a think tank almost where you can strategize yes. on things that yes. are, are working. What's not working. What are you seeing? Are you experiencing this? Okay. It's not just me. Like sometimes it's just that yes. grounding of like, we are all figuring this out. You're not yes. alone can really just be an extra push um, on this journey. So Practitioners that are on this, that are listening, make sure you visit um, convergemasterminds.com to get more information about this really exciting um, space that Valerie is creating for, for, um, for you all. Thank you. Okay, so I have a few questions um, that have come through. Um, and think. one that kind of leads <laughs> into kind of what we were just talking about. Um, and I'm trying to find it because it was, uh, okay, yeah. So DEI is being threatened significantly right now in a multitude of ways. And so what can each of us do to help protect the integrity of the work? Oh, who put that question <laughs> in the chat, Chad? That is- <laughs> No, this came through. This is oh, that's right. not every yes. day. It came through. Right. We talked about this a little bit before. I mean, the word integrity though, we didn't talk about integrity. We talked about just sustaining the work, but the word integrity is really what hit me when you said that. <laughs> No, it is, it is, it's, it's not surprising, you know, the attacks, but it's also just like, are you serious? You know, yeah. this is, this is, this is wild, but <laughs> yeah. well, I think one it, with anything and, and especially with DEI, because I've been doing this for, for a while and it is cyclical, right? I mean, we're in the middle of this current cycle, but the work is cyclical where I found that organizations care a lot and then it mm -hmm. just kind of wanes. And, un and unfortunately, that's just been my experience in our career. So one, I think you have to figure out what is my work in this space? 
And how can I be the most effective as a DEI practitioner? So sometimes that means staying in your specialty mm -hmm. and leaning into that. Sometimes that means developing new skills and maybe adjacent skills um, to support the work. So my team, we operate very much like a collective where we're all specialists in some way. Um, and we all kind of have our own practices and we come together to collaborate on clients with clients. And it's, it's I'm finding a lot of pe people are like departing from saying I'm a DEI person. Maybe I'm an equity person, or maybe I specialize in workplace wellness, or maybe I, you know, really, so you're kind of sneak door, sneak backdooring the, uh, the DEI work under something that is like a little bit of a softer term. Um, so I'm seeing that that's happening for people to like proof their careers, but also still continue to do the work and to infuse the work into other functions that organizations may be leaning into or investing in. So, so we, but you asked about integrity, you asked <laughs> yeah. about integrity. Yeah. So you said we're, integrity. We're, 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 we're honing in on that <laughs> word. <laughs> <laughs> I think for that, to preserve the integrity of the work, we have to think about the historical context of the work, right? And we know that DEI was birthed out of the civil rights movement here in the United States, and it's obviously grown globally because we know oppression and everything exists globally. But to maintain the integrity of this work, we must not forget why we're doing this work and where this work is rooted in. And so I think we all have to do a better job of understanding those contexts and explaining those contexts in our moments with our clients and with our organizations. Because I think that will help us continue to sustain the work when we understand our history, that'll inform where we're trying to go. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And it's, it's really, like you said, and someone put it in the chat, like the importance of wellness and equity. I, I yes. really I really think that is so important. And okay, yeah. I think I can squeeze in one more question. One if more that's question. okay. Okay, okay. Um, and <laughs> I I am going to pull it because it came from another. Um, but um let's see here. Okay, I have a couple and I'm trying to decide which is going to be the best. Go for it. Why, why choose? Why choose? Why choose? We're, just, <laughs> we're gonna do both. We'll do both of them. We're gonna throw them both in there. Okay. So my first is, okay, how can companies kind of adjust company norms to help them track the more millennial, more millennials and Gen Z professionals? And I ask because, especially Gen Z, they're not playing, okay? It's not about, they are very clear. <laughs> what, what they have is um, that uh, strategy or that, um, that, um, that they, they know their why. They're very clear on their why. Very clear. Very clear, and they know <laughs> what they're looking for. So, how can companies, as they're trying to attract this talent, what what can they adjust? What you know, what norms can they adjust to kind of better, you know, attract that? And then, um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the second question, so you can just kind yeah. of knock them together. Um, do what brands are doing DEI well, and mm. in what regard? And you know, is there a model? Like, is there something that someone who mm. you know, I know budgets are being slashed, maybe. The investment for that is not there. Is there someone that you can look at or that you would, a brand that you would say, yes, I feel like they're doing this right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we get that question often. And I, for the brand, excuse me, for the brand question, I say, I think there are organizations that are doing elements of DEI really well. So um, I, I don't know if I would say that there's like one organization that is like stellar at DEI, mm -hmm. but of course I don't know. I'm not, I don't know the insides of many organizations. So one organization that um, I think does really well um, is LinkedIn. And so mm -hmm. from a, from a women's leadership perspective, just the investment in many communities, but I just happen to know a lot, their investment in women programming and um, they just do a really, really good job of being attentive to employee needs and to developing programming and infrastructure to support employee needs. So I think they're doing good there. I think there's some organizations that are doing better on diversity and representation and leadership um, as well. So I'll just leave them as my one example. Okay. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um but to your question around um, attracting Gen Zs and millennials, I think it's back to that piece about like flexibility. You know, I came up in tech when we had to go in the office and they were like, 
you know, shiny workplaces and free meals before yes. we realized that they just wanted us to like work all day because <laughs> um, they were feeding us, right? You know, yes. you can't you can't do those things anymore. It's less attractive to uh, these populations, right? So you got to think about what is attractive to these populations and what are they being bringing to the workforce. And I think it's really back to that key of flexibility, flexible work options, flexible ways to engage with them, whether it is a full, full employment or contracting, freelancing, et cetera. So it's all about flexibility moving yeah. forward. So if yeah. you're not you know, you know, looking at your infrastructure to see how we can flex a little bit, then you're kind of, you're kind of behind. Yes. Okay. Yes. I love that. And Valerie, listen, we have to, we could continue going. Cause I'm telling you, <laughs> I have so many questions that came through <laughs> for you. And I feel like a couple more were dropped in the chat. So we yeah. would love to invite you back again. I know we're at the top of the hour, but we always like to ask our hosts to just kind of sum it up for us. What is one thing that you would want to be the key takeaway from our conversation today? Um, just how would you want to close us out? And thank you, thank yes. you, thank you so much for joining us. I've so enjoyed this conversation with you today. Same, same, Courtney. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, I'm going to just sum it up. Um, like I mentioned, I'm in a rest season myself mm -hmm. right now. And so if you haven't prioritized rest for yourself, if there's not, not a restful period coming up for you mm -hmm. as practitioners on the call, you know, figure, figure that out, figure out how to carve out some time for yourself and to reconnect with your why to this work on a regular basis. So that's my final thought. Um, but feel free, everyone, please reach out to me. If you have questions, you didn't get your questions answered, um, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to, to find some time. Yes, and y'all grab those links in the chat. They are there for you. Thank you so much. I think that's a beautiful way to wrap this up. We hope you all have a beautiful weekend. Um, enjoy, hopefully you're having some good weather and we'll see you next week. Awesome, thank Thanks. you. Bye. <laughs>